A relationship with the right referral partner could be a game changer for any B2B company. So what if you could reverse engineer these relationships at a moment's notice? Start a podcast. Invite potential referral partners to be guests on your show. And grow your referral network faster than ever. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. I'm your host for today's episode, Logan Lyles, Director of Partnerships here at Sweetfish. I am joined today by Jay Akunzo. He is a repeat guest on this podcast. Very excited to have him back. He is the founder of Unthinkable Media. Jay is also a keynote speaker. He's the author of the new book, Break the Wheel, as well as the host of the podcast, Unthinkable. Jay, how's it going today, man? Going pretty well. Thanks for having me back. Hey, it is a pleasure to have you on, a fellow podcaster and uh, a great guy with a ton of experience to share with our audience. Um, a, a longer than usual intro, you are definitely a busy guy. <laughs> I'm what a, a friend of mine, Chase Jarvis from Creative Live, he likes to say we're all hyphens when we're in the creative <laughs> world, so I am definitely a hyphen. Yeah, you got a few hyphens in there, man. So folks that aren't familiar with you, Jay, haven't heard uh, you on this show or listened to your podcast or engaged with you in some other way on social media, give them a little bit of background on uh, your background as well as some of the things you've been up to lately. Yeah, for sure. So I, I mean, my you can distill all of my work down to one core belief, which is that people draw incredible meaning from their work, from their careers, from the business world. But the content that we create around those topics tends to fall flat. They tend to be boring commodity pieces or shows, very copycat oriented in, in a given niche. We just don't get the emotional reflection back to us based on the emotions we actually experience in our work. So I like to say that no matter what I'm creating, if it's a speech to a thousand people in a room or it's a podcast episode or you know a single email I'm sending, I, I like to make people feel and remind them why they do the work that they do. Because I think on top of that first principle, you can do some pretty great work. So mm -hmm. that's kind of my bent. And I've, I've carried that with me throughout my career. So I started in sports media and very quickly realized I didn't want to be a print journalist in the, you know, the digital age and actually found a job at Google as a digital media strategist. So it was my job to basically advise brands on how to evolve digitally using Google's products. Well, I, I love that that idea of bringing feeling and emotion and, and our humanness, uh, especially to something that can be kind of stale and boring uh, sometimes, especially in B2B marketing. I personally have been a fan of what you've been helping uh, do with the Exceptions series within Seeking Wisdom, Drift's podcast, and uh, taken a lot of value from those and love, you know, I definitely see that in some of the content that you're helping produce the feelings and the emotions that brands are, are tapping into, at least the companies with the strong brand presence. With that being said, Jay, let's dive in because we're going to be breaking down some of the key points from your new book that just launched uh, here in October, uh, Break the Wheel. It's all about questioning best practices, honing your intuition, and really using those two things to do your best work. So uh, let's open it up with why you wanted to write this book and the problem that you feel like it's addressing. We're getting really, really good, especially in B2B at finding best practices, but finding best practices is not the goal. Finding the best approach for you is. So 
how do we do that? <laughs> I mean, we've never been taught that. Like we don't right. discuss this often enough. We, we don't mm -hmm. discuss the nuance between, and I think it's a crucial detail, the difference between best practice and best for us. We've certainly never been taught how to find the right approach for us. We've just been taught that there's a right and a wrong answer from the moment we learn that in school on through to the working world. And in today's world, there's more quote unquote right answers than ever before. And mm -hmm. so the, the real skill isn't finding best practices, it's contextualizing them or crafting your own even. The real mm -hmm. skill is making the best possible decision in your situation, regardless of the generality or the precedent. And unfortunately, that's just not something we've been taught how to do. And so that was the exploration in the book. Yeah. And I think that has a lot of applications. You know, I hear sales leaders talking about, you know, lean on structure, not scripts. Take all of the learnings and the content that you're consuming and and use it as a backbone, piecemeal it together in what works for you. But just following a script, you know, isn't going to help you out. And it's same in a lot of different areas. And I think you touch on something there, you know, as knowledge workers and as people trying to create things in the market, a, a lot of what what we struggle with is what to do and, and how to do it. You know, uh, generations before had had a task to do, whether you're on assembly line or something like that, this concept of thinking so hard about our work and figuring out what direction to take wasn't as much of a, a challenge as it is today, right? Oh, 100%. There's no one right answer. And I would even go back to the example you just gave if you're in sales and someone's saying, well, don't just stick to a script. That's good advice in general but we don't operate in a generality. So there are people in this world who should stick to a script or they should use the script in certain moments for certain interactions or at a certain time in their life or career. You know, we, we're living through this era where all these how-tos are being misconstrued as have-tos and they're not. Like a, a best practice is not an answer, it's a possibility. And now it's up to you to vet that possibility in your own unique context. So one of the things we have to do, I think, is flip the notion of what great work requires. It's not expertise. That, that is now table stakes. It's not the how to do. <laughs> it's self-awareness and situational awareness. You know, the ability mm -hmm. to find the right path forward based on you and your team, your resources, your specific customer or audience or client, whoever the work is for. Identifying that stuff and understanding that first, it kind of forms like a filter around your brain and that lets you make decisions faster you know very quickly you can say to an expert yes you're right no you're wrong or actually you're only part way there but the only way you can do that is if you actually understand what you're all about in your situation first again not the skill we've developed and that's a real problem for many many people and businesses today I love that. It, it's all about the context and as you touched on the situational awareness. So one of the things that you touched on in the book, Jay, are these three psychological barriers that are standing in our way. And I'd like to break down each one of those, have you kind of define and then talk a little bit about you know how we can approach a solution to each one. The first one that you mentioned is the Pike syndrome. Tell us a little bit about this and how we can work to address it. Sure. So Pike syndrome, I think the first thing that people are latching onto isn't what is that? It's why is the word pike? What, what's with this fish? So imagine that there's a pike swimming around in an aquarium. This is actually the beginnings of a scientific experiment that explains why we don't make good decisions and why we go seeking our answers out there, so to speak, you know, looking for the precedent or case study. So imagine a pike is swimming around an aquarium. If you drop some minnows into the tank, the pike is going to eat them right away. But in this experiment, scientists lowered the minnows in surrounded by some glass, and it turns out the pike can't actually see the glass. And so he just starts smashing up against it, and he'll do this for like an hour, and then finally he decides that he can't eat minnows. He basically conditions himself that he, he's learned that minnows are not food. And then the scientists remove the glass from behind the minnows, and they can swim freely around that tank undisturbed by the pike. So this is called learned helplessness. And I think, unfortunately, we all suffer from a degree of learned helplessness in our work. I think from the moment we're taught there's a right and a wrong answer, or from the moment a boss says, this is how we do things around here, for whatever reason, we've learned that we can't possibly bring anything to bear today ourselves in our, in our situation based on our observations. So we remove the self and situational awareness that we have, and we go seeking answers out there. You know, and just like with the pike, where like tasty little morsels swam in front of his nose, 
I think tasty little details, little bits of context are swimming in front of you every day. And we don't use that information to inform our decisions. And in the book, and, and really even before that on my show, Unthinkable, these stories that I tell are examples of work that seems crazy until you hear their story, in which case it seems logical. And the difference is these people have gotten over Pike syndrome and they just make decisions based on a detail in their context that we, from the outside looking in, don't have access to them. And so I think that's how you combat Pike syndrome. When you're acting helpless, when you feel like there's, you know, what could I possibly do or what could I possibly know in the face of all this endless advice, let the customer be the guide or the client or the, you know, the audience member if you're publishing content like I do. You find something called a first principle insight, which is a basic but really hard to reach truth about what customers are actually after. So a really pithy example is that nobody buys a better pillow. They're buying a better night's sleep. But if, yeah. if you just customer become the guide or the person who you're trying to serve, all of a sudden it does not matter what an expert says you have to do because very quickly you can say, yeah, but this, this signal I'm getting from my audience says they love long form newsletters but you're telling me to publish really short news roundups. What gives? And who should you listen to? Certainly not mm. the expert saying publish something shorter. It's the audience you're serving, giving you emotional feedback that says, I love this. So we, we suffer from learned helplessness, aka Pike syndrome. And the solution is to find a first principle insight about your audience and let that inform your decisions. And in the book, I talk about how to go about doing that. I love it. That's such a powerful analogy. And I think we can all think of specific ones in in our own example, especially in the B2B sales and marketing space where, uh, like you said, how-tos, we, we equate them to have-tos instead of looking at the things that actually should guide us. The next thing that you touch on uh, as far as a psychological barrier, Jay, is the foraging choice. Tell us a little bit more about this one and break it down for us. So the foraging choice, which is actually uh, it just published recently from, it was a study, I think three months ago, you know, we're speaking in October, I think it was two or three months ago, a study out of NYU and uh, foraging choice. It didn't have a name in this study. I think science could use a little marketing once in a while. Um, so I, I came up with a name and I got the approval from my wife, who is a PhD in, in clinical psychology. So there you go. That's perfect. It the foraging choice, the foraging choice is the decision between exploiting your current position or exploring other possibilities. So think of this like, you know, the problem we all identify with marketing, and even though we do it, we still laugh about it. What do we do when we find that something worked in the past? Or what do we do if somebody says X, Y, or Z works in marketing? We beat it to death. We ruin it, right? We just cling to it. <laughs> That's an example of making the foraging choice you've chosen to exploit instead of explore new possibilities. Mm -hmm. And it's named for this idea that a lot of decisions that we make at work resemble a foraging decision from a squirrel or another animal where you have this existing position, you know, the tried and true playbook, the conventional wisdom. And instead of exploring how to evolve that and update your knowledge of the world or how to, you know, test your way forward to learn something new, we cling to it because of one variable that gets introduced to our world, stress. So in the study, it showed that when people feel stressed, whether that was chronic or acute, you tend to cling to your existing position instead of explore new possibilities. And so one good example of this is, I don't know if anyone here has followed, if you're listening, Merriam-Webster Dictionary on Twitter. L Logan, is that somebody that you're familiar with, that brand? Well, I'm familiar with the brand, but I haven't followed them on, on Twitter. I, I love Wendy's uh, stream. That's good for some hilarity, but I haven't followed Merriam-Webster's uh, Dictionary on Twitter. So excited to learn more here, man. So, so they were clinging to their existing position when their chief digital officer, a woman named Lisa Schneider, first joined the business, I think in like 2016, 2012, somewhere in that range. And basically what they were doing on Twitter is automating away any emotion and automating away any personality. So in the morning, they would publish a word of the day and then at night a quiz and they would do this every day. So they were exploiting an existing position. And Lisa was like, we have to explore new possibilities. This is boring and bland and predictable. And so when I spoke with her, I asked her what it took. And obviously it took a lot of hard work and it took a long time. But one of the turning points was that she said to her team, look, we as dictionary uh, uh, brand marketers, I guess you could say, which is such a weird thing to be, but you're a dictionary <laughs> brand marketer. Yeah. And we as lexicographers, which is a dictionary editor, lexicographer, we are not in the business 
of defining rules and staying rigid. That's actually a misnomer about the dictionary that the public doesn't know. They don't set rules like a grammar you know, stickler would. They document language as it's actually used. And that's why we see all these slang words eventually becoming a word in the dictionary. That's mm-hmm. why the word irregardless, even though it was incorrect <laughs> at first, it was used so much that it's now in the dictionary. Dictionaries document pop culture, essentially, the pop culture of language. And they weren't portraying that at all. They have to keep the pulse of pop culture, but they were being so damn boring on Twitter. So she said to her team, let's show the world how fun and relevant we are, which is basically an example of a type of goal that includes a level of hunger or dissatisfaction. It's not just your intent for the future. It's some change you need to make to get there. You know, that's what a goal often misses. It's the change you want to focus on, not the mile marker, not the metric. So she said, let's show the world how fun and relevant we really are. And fast forward to today, and they're, they're hysterical and sarcastic and viral. They're, they're, they're beloved. Mm-hmm. Now, in the book, I talk about what that, that it is, is an example of, which is an aspirational anchor. So an aspirational mm-hmm. anchor is a far better goal if the goal is to change, if you want to do better than the status quo the intent for the future plus some kind of hunger you have today. So if your if your tendency is to cling to the existing position, that's how you make the foraging choice and your boss says grow the Twitter account 50% month over month. That incentivizes like anything and everything you can do to just repeat the work you used to do that worked in the past or maybe like tweak it slightly or grab some kind of secret or hack or tip or trick from an expert, you're going to cling to what you think is sound and safe and normal, you're not going to go exploring. But if you can Mm -hmm. inspire your team with an aspirational anchor, if you can focus on the change you make, all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait, I got to go. I can't keep exploiting. I got to go exploring. That's the goal. So Mm -hmm. in the face of the foraging choice, which cripples us when we make decisions and we cling to conventional wisdom, articulate an aspiration or an aspirational anchor for your team and all of a sudden you'll orient around exploration and testing instead of exploitation today's growth story is about an enterprise all flash storage hardware vendor serving 20 percent of fortune 100 companies but here's the issue they were struggling to engage with prospects across different territories with a goal of growing their customer base this hardware vendor decided to work with a partner on high impact direct mail delivered to over 800 profiled leads across the UK, France, South Africa, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland. This resulted in a 54.4% increase in total contract value. Wow. So who is the partner that delivered these results with direct mail? MRP Prolytics. MRP Prolytics is an insights-powered account-based marketing platform with streaming predictive analytics baked into its core. Integrating multi-channel ABM execution on these insights, MRP Prolytics triggers display, email, direct mail, and global inside sales in real time, helping the largest marketing departments in the world deliver the right message to their customers at just the right time. So could MRP Prolytics work for you too? There's a real good chance it could. Find out by visiting mrpfd.com or click the link in the episode description of this interview. All right. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, I, I love that that aspirational anchor idea. I think that's very practical for for both leaders to to inspire the sort of change in the goal setting uh, that you mentioned of their team, and a, a thought to to put in the minds of of folks trying to reach for bigger and better things and and grow their team and and reach new goals. The last thing you wanted to touch on, Jay, was this idea of cultural fluency. Tell us a little bit about the the struggle that we that we all encounter here psychologically and how we can approach a new solution to it. Sure. So cultural fluency is how you behave when the world unfolds according to the expected norm. In other words, you go with the flow when things seem like they're the typical day or typical approach or typical tactic. You know, you go with the flow. It's culturally fluent to do something. Uh, and in the book, I talked to a guy named Jim Mori, who's a psychologist in Chicago who works for the University of DePaul. And Jim ran an experiment to study this idea of cultural fluency and more importantly, how to break from it. Basically, he went to his family, his mother's house. Uh, They were throwing a 4th of July picnic, and he enrolled all of these people attending, unbeknownst to them, in a psychological study. 
So you you know you know how you do stuff like that you know around the family Logan <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah exactly <laughs> totally normal picnic stuff so, so <laughs> it gave half of the group right before they took their food white plates and half of the group festive Fourth of July plates and the group that took the Fourth of July plates they took significantly more food than the group with white plates so this suggests that perhaps when something is completely in flow it's it's right exactly unfolding as you'd expect you just turn off your brain and do what's expected of you, which on the fourth is to gorge yourself. And then right. later that year, he did this in a different way. He went to a Labor Day picnic, also at his mom's house, also ran an experiment unbeknownst to people. Never, ever, ever say yes if you get invited to Jim Murray's picnics. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he gave half the group white plates again and half the group, this time, Halloween plates on Labor Day. So now the group with the very out of place pumpkins and ghosts took less food. So taken together, this provides at least initial support that when things unfold as you expect, you're mindless. You go with the flow. But if a detail seems out of place, even if it's slight and even if it's subconscious, you start to be more mindful of your environment and you make better decisions. So in mm -hmm. our work, if we're trying to improve our decision making, we need to get out of this mindless behavior of just repeating what we've always done, the way we've always done it. Why? I don't know, because that's how we do things around here. Right, that's mm -hmm. mindless. And to be more mindful, to pull out better bits of context, those proverbial minnows swimming in front of our face, we can ask something called a trigger question. So we, we explore two types of questions in the book, and one of them is a trigger question, which is basically an open-ended question about your scenario. And the only way to answer it is through reflection. You got to actually think how novel in the business world. And you also have to <laughs> test. You can't Google it. Right. So right. If, if Lisa is saying, let's let's show the world how fun and relevant we really are, Merriam-Webster Dictionary marketers, and somebody says how they can't go Google it. They, they don't have a past precedent. There is no trend or best practice or expert who can say, I have the answer. It applies everywhere. You have to investigate and test. So a trigger question introduces what psychologists call cultural disfluency because you're disrupted from the flow. Uh, an open-ended question means by definition, you don't know the answer yet. And so whether you're scared of that or it just forces you to stop and think critically, you separate from this endless cycle of conventional wisdom and best practices just enough to become mindful and start to try and figure out new ways forward. And typically when you're asking questions, you're acting like an investigator, not an expert. You care about evidence not absolutes. And that mm -hmm. is the fundamental change throughout all of these psychological barriers. Investigators have almost no trouble with these problems. But when you either cling to an expert or try to act like an expert, now you fall victim to these three. Mm -hmm. So on that note of of taking uh, almost a, a journalist or an investigative mindset to everything and, and not letting your presuppositions stand in your way, I know you touched on this interesting uh, story in the book about why newspapers use broadsheet paper and how some disruption there and looking at a, a challenge in a different way led to led to a different outcome. Do you mind sharing that one before we wrap up, Jay? I love this because I, I mentioned I started in print and I know you started as a journalist too. Um, so historically, there's a convention in print publishing for newspapers called broadsheets. It's about 22 inches big. It's the standard piece of paper you would use to print your newspaper. And in the early 2000s, The Independent over in the UK, it's a paper out there, The Independent, they decided to shrink their pages to something called tabloid sheets and they were criticized by their peers. But the problem is those peers didn't realize why broadsheets were actually a best practice in the first place. Right. So, They're horrible to try and actually hold and, and fold, and it takes so much to manage. I, I wondered that as, as I was in journalism school, like, why is this the standard when it's actually really tough for people to deal with? Even if it was an amazing experience, Logan, it's like, if you're going to cling to a trend, at least know why the hell this matters to your business, right? Because if you know the why, that leads to better, more original thinking, or at least the willingness to test against the, the established norm. And these people did not know the why. But it turns out, so I did some research. I talked to um, an author friend of mine, Shane Snow, who originally dug up this story. And it, it's kind of ridiculous. It's hilarious, but also horrifying. In 1712, ridiculous already, the British <laughs> government imposed a tax on newspapers. And so essentially, they wanted to tax you based on the number of pages in your paper. So being very smart, think for yourself kind of people, 
those publishers just increase the sizes of their pages. <laughs> so basically, you could use the same number of words, but on fewer sheets. So they yep. found a loophole. And as you progress through time, slowly by slowly, that becomes the norm until in the 1800s, the tax was repealed, but it really didn't matter because the best practice you know, was underway. Yep. It was already established thinking, right? That's right. So in the 2000s, when the independent questioned that, everybody laughed at them. But then they saved money and sold more print papers. And why did nobody else see the opportunity? And why did they see it as ridiculous? Because they knew the best practice. They knew the generality. They clung like like the Dickens to the trend. And they didn't question it enough. And the independent did. They, they thought for themselves in a world full of conventional thinkers. I love it. It's such a great example of, you know, it, touching on a couple of the the different psychological barriers in in that one story, clinging to something that uh, was established as a best practice, not even because it was a best practice. And oh, by the way, it was back in 1712. Uh, I, I think there you couldn't get a more glaring example of uh, how our learned helplessness and clinging to best practices can actually can actually hurt us there. But Jay, this has been a, a phenomenal episode. I really appreciate the conversation. If anybody listening to this would like to stay connected with you, reach out or find the book to dig into more of these stories and examples in how they can do their best work, what's the best way for them to go about doing that, man? Yeah, sure. So there's two ways. There's two things you can do. Uh, one is very simple. The other is an offer for you. So the simple thing is you can head over to Amazon or you can go to my website, jayaconzo.com and learn more about the book and buy it there. And the offer to you is because you spent so much time listening to this, and I really do appreciate that level of time investment as a podcaster myself, I'm happy to do what I'd call a, a buy one, gift one deal where you can buy one of the books, send me a receipt or a screenshot, and then give me the name and address of the person you'd most like me to gift a book to on your behalf. I'll basically buy a second book on my dime and gift it to whoever you want with a little note that makes it clear it's from you. Because I, I think books are a gift. So that's the buy one, gift one approach. I just so appreciate you spending time with me on this show, and, and I'm happy to offer that to everybody listening. I love that you wrap up a, a creative way to promote your book and share the knowledge that that I haven't seen anyone else do as of lately. So, Dude, I got to interject really quick. The first principle insight of the book, the first mm -hmm. principle insight idea from the book applies here. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to sell a million books. I'd like mm -hmm. a million people to read my book. So mm -hmm. if that's my self-awareness, then I don't need to sell every single book that I give away. I'd like to give away a few. Um, yeah. So it comes back to just, you know, I, I'm trying to develop my own self-awareness and I hope people who read this can too. Yeah, I, I love it. Practicing what you preach right there, man. This has been phenomenal. Uh, again, we've been talking to Jay Kunzo, and I really appreciate you coming back on the show. Thanks so much for being on. Thanks so much for having me and, and to people who did finish an entire episode of a podcast. I know that's no small feat, again, as a serial podcaster. So thank you so much for listening. Digital marketing agencies have a tough job. You have to stay on top of the latest marketing strategies for your clients and your agency. What if there was a way you could address both at the same time? Imagine your agency putting out content with greater quality and quantity. Envision bringing your clients a turnkey solution for one of B2B marketing's fastest growing media strategies, podcasting. You know all those clients asking for your help with their account-based marketing efforts? Picture being the first to bring them the idea of content-based networking, showing them the proven strategy for breaking into their most coveted accounts. Here's the concept. Sweetfish Media is looking to work with a limited number of innovative agencies interested in a new partnership model. We produce a podcast for your agency. You introduce the power of podcasting and Sweetfish services to your clients. Everybody wins. Learn more at sweetfishpartners.com.